my first meeting here with Karula, sitting in the shade, cheap as I nearly missed her. As I was driving around, I was looking, I was like, just looking at her tracks all the way down the road. And then I look up and she's right in front of us. Isn't this fantastic, everyone? I'm so excited. She, oh, cheap as the feeling of just coming across a leopard in the wild is such an amazing experience. Beautiful. <sighs> Hello, everyone. I am Sam Chevalier here in the Sabi Sands, northeast of the Sabi Sands, in just, just next to the Kruger National Park. I'm here with Jean Dre. It's been a while since I've been with Jean Dre behind the camera. It's going to be an exciting day. It was an exciting morning, I must tell you. We sat with uh, breeding herds of buffaloes, we sat with Ellie's, and we sat with some kudu. And now we are sitting here with a beautiful female leopard, Karula. Wow. Isn't this amazing? Yo, this is incredible, everyone. I'm so, so excited to come across this beautiful female. I've heard so much about you. So much. Everyone, all the viewers are in love with you. To finally meet your acquaintance is quite a feeling. Look at your beautiful eyes. Wow. Wow, it's incredible to, to learn so much about a leopard and, and then to finally see it. It makes you stop in awe for a second. You can see she's had a, she's, she's been breathing a lot. She's tired. It's a very hot day today. Very, very, very hot day today. This morning it was 22 degrees, which I think is around 72 Fahrenheit. And this afternoon it's now 32 degrees Celsius, which is around 80 something Fahrenheit, which is, you know, it's very, very hot. So the day's progressed and the sightings have progressed and my enjoyment has just only increased throughout the day. Such an incredible day of viewing animals. Jamie and many others are asking, where are the cubs? This is the exact thing that was about to come in, into the conversation. I have no idea where the cubs are yet, but What's important is that we don't go looking, of course. We're going to sit here with Karula and just spend some time with her. You know, I want to marvel in her beauty for a few seconds. And hopefully, if we're very lucky, if we're privileged, we'll be able to see the beautiful cubs in our presence. But wow, this is great. I've got a feeling they're probably just out to the, to the west of us. This is exactly where I saw the cubs just the other day when I came out with Brent. We went just into the bushes and we got off the vehicle and we walked for about 50 meters and next thing I saw Karula get up. So I have actually met Karula, but this is the first stable meeting that I've had with Karula. The last one was she got up and she ran away very quickly from me and Brent. And then the two cubs just very quickly popped their head and they had a look at us. Ooh, beautiful yawn. And they had a look at us and it was, ooh. And then I turned around and we had to walk away. But what a sighting that was to be with two beautiful cubs in Karula just on Saturday. So that was just three days ago. And it was quite literally on this corner. So just down the road there on Shabam, we came across that sighting. But this is a, this is a great question. I wonder where these cubs are. Where are your cubs, Karula? Amazing, everyone. This is an incredible little sighting that we are having here. So I've, see, I've seen Tingana, and now I'm seeing Karula. Yes, Safari, Gene, it is very hot out here in the African savanna. It's definitely, without a doubt, the hottest day that I've had here. When I arrived, it was actually fairly cool and uh, gotcha, and it has only just progressed in heat. And I'm quite, I'm very excited to be back out in the bush, as um, the last few days I've been struggling with my ear. Uh, my ear's just trying to cope with the conditions here in the bush, and so it's great to be back here 
out with you all and to have had already so many epic sightings with leopards and everything. So I can see Genre smiling, smiling in the background. I told, I told him, I literally said to him, Genre, when we come around that corner, we're going to come across uh, Karula and the Cubs. So we've seen Karula. All we need now is just an epic sighting of those Cubs. And we would have had such, I mean, it's not even five minutes into the drive. Eh? Jeez, we come across straight into to the sightings of Karula and the Cubs. So, Chandre, I told you. So, while we're sitting here in the shade together with Karula, while we think about where the Cubs might be, Let's go and have a look and see how Brent is doing with the elephant bull. See you now. Welcome to the Sunset Safari, and what a fantastic start. Now, I, Brian and I are very excited. Look at this. This is the epitome of an African elephant bull, probably one of the biggest tuskers we've ever seen, or well, since I've been on Safari Live, in full must, in search of a breeding herd, it's just the most powerful and impressive animal here in the African bush. Oh, he is absolutely gorgeous. Big, big bull, probably 40 ish, 40 to 45 years old, in his prime. Let's try and have a look at those big teeth of his. Look at those tusks. It's not often we see an elephant bull with tusks like this. They're not the longest. They, if they are very long, but just look at that width. That's probably 15 centimeters in diameter. So I'm not sure what that is in inches, but a, a good inch and a half, maybe two. And that's just the circumference on that. So really impressive ivory on this African giant. Hey, mister. Of course, these big bulls are incredibly powerful animals. And when they are in must, like this guy is, you can see the dribble from the penal sheath. And they can lose 100 liters of fluid in a day while they're in must. They can be a little bit unpredictable. There's hormones raging through their system. But if you stay calm and collected, they can be some of the most spectacular animals to spend time with. And generally, when these guys get upset with you, it's your fault, not theirs. You moved the vehicle badly, you've made the wrong noise. Uh, as you can see, he is taking little to no interest to us, in us. He was on a real mission when we found him, stomping off. I'm pretty sure he's either herd or he's on the scent of a breeding herd. But uh, he just stopped for a quick snap. Welcome to Safari Live, as I, I think I forgot to mention because I was so excited by this Ellie. My name is Brent Garrismith. I have Brian Joubert and the thumb on the back with me. What is the thumb today? Cool cat. He's a cool cat. It always amazes me how such a huge, dark animal can function in the heat. It's a 31 degrees Celsius, which if I remember correctly is about mid 80s in Fahrenheit. And they're one of the few animals that's at home in the heat of the day, moving vast distances, feeding, supplying nutrients to that massive frame. He's moving off into that thicket there. We're definitely not going to tempt fate by bashing and crashing around after him. But what I am going to try to do is get up ahead of him and try a second guess where he's going to come out. Because as much as I love the cats, there is just something so incredibly special about these really big monster Ellie bulls. Shortcut down to the road. 
This is one of those nice big seat lines that are utilized by the animals quite nicely. You can see this big animal track here. Just moving through these quarry thickets. Okay, so if we guess his trajectory almost, he should be coming out just beyond that dead knob form. Hello, hello piggy. And there's a small, a smaller great grey beast that has tusks. Hello, Madam Mortal. Looks like you've been having a nice mud wallow today. You can see it's a female. Due to the fact she's only got those top set of warts. Ah. I was wondering, I thought it's quite strange to see you all on your lonesome, but there are some more just hiding in the thickets just beyond. Very relaxed female. Normally, we often see them scuttling off at the distance. No offense to you, Warty. We're after a grey beast, slightly bigger teeth. under his nose. When they are in must, they can be a little bit distracted. Maybe he found a testy morsel in the middle of the block and have a snap on. Try to smell him. Speaking of the impressive elephants, Virginia is wondering if the naughty elephant with the hole in his ear has been seen recently. And that he has, Virginia. I saw him just yesterday on my way out to town. Oh. There he is, snuck out behind us. that you can see those massive tusks pretty about the power lines but still spectacular I mean, he's definitely on a mission but with that huge bulk you have to stop and keep fortified while chasing ladies Otherwise, you're just not going to have the reserves when you catch up with them. I love that swagger of an elephant bull, especially a big boy like that. He knows there's nothing out there that can really mess with him. He's going to come quite close to us now. So we're just going to have to keep quite still while he sneaks past us. But I think he might stop. No, I thought he might go for that buffalo thorn. Oh, he's thinking about it. Oh, he smelt it. There's a buffalo thorn snack first. Oh, unfortunately, just another vehicle that seems to have spooked him a little bit. So we're just going to keep still. breathing herd. While we do that, let's jump back on board with Sam and the Queen of Juma. Here we are, everyone. We're back with Karula. 
It's great to have you back here. It's been, it's been interesting. We've been listening out for the sound of any cub calls uh, or anything, even the smell of anything, just to try and understand what is going on around Karula and if there are any other dynamics unfolding in the scene that we've just entered. So there could be anything happening, but we are just going to sit here and enjoy the presence of Karula until we see that she's interested in moving off or trying to find her cubs. We'll track her, we'll stay with her, and we're going to spend some time to get to know you a little bit better. It's, it's fascinating to spend some time with this beautiful-looking female leopard. I've, I haven't spent time with a female leopard in a long time. I heard that many of you guys were all at that sighting with the female mating with, uh, with Tingana. That must have been a great sighting to have watched. I wanted to spend a whole day just on my own in a vehicle, just tracking the female and the male mating. I had to make sure I didn't lose that sighting. And it was such an unreal, unreal day of my life to, to spend the two, you know, just to spend with two leopards and, and, and watching the way in which they procreate. I mean, it's just really fascinating to see how the female puts in so much effort to, to make sure that she can impregnate herself and start uh, dispersing her seed around the African savanna. And so here we are with Karula. This is probably going to be the first encounter of many, I hope, um, here in the Sabi Sands. I'm sure you guys all know her a, l very, a lot more than what I do. And I appreciate all the feedback that's been coming through from the viewers. I've had many, many messages and all sorts of things telling me about, the, about Karula and her different dynamics and who she's mated in the past. And, and so I'm receiving that all slowly but surely as I sit here at Juma inside the, inside the beautiful reserve of Juma. And she's just shaking her head. Let's have a look and see how she's doing. If you guys have any comments and help me learn a little bit more Karula while you're sitting back wherever you are in the world, please hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and give me some facts about Karula that I could learn while we sit here with her. Or please just um, otherwise, email Safari Live. Questions at safarilive.tv. That would be fantastic. And we can get to know this beautiful golden leopard that sits before us that has brought you so much happiness in the past. I just want to thank Karula for such an awesome experience that I had meeting her and her cubs the other day. It was, so, it was just magical. Huh? To be given the opportunity to, to see a leopard in the wild and to especially see a leopard and its cubs is, is a significant one and I'll never forget it for the rest of my life. It'll always be you, Karula, that brought me that gift, so thank you very much. But hopefully, as the day goes on, we'll be able to learn a little bit more from her. But she looks exceptionally tired. We had a comment earlier that it looks like she's drooling a little bit. And that is, yeah, she was drooling a little bit. I'm sure she, she will be doing for the course of the afternoon. It's been an exceptionally hot day here in the bush. She's just panting her. Eh? Amazing. The shock that I got when I saw Karula was just, she was, my adrenaline was pumping. <laughs> just sitting there with Chandra, I was like, found, found the tracks. I was very excited to find the tracks. And I was contemplating getting out and seeing if I can do a little quick walk. And next thing, she was right in front of our vehicle. She was right there. So I was, thank you, awesome sighting. Yeah. If anyone has some screenshots, please screenshot there. You've got a perfect sighting of, of the, the spot pattern of, of Karula. I'd love, if you have that, please send it through to Safari Live. And, and we can just keep it. And I can classify it as one of my first encounters here with this beautiful female leopard. And then I could also get to know her spot pattern a little bit better. Um, as you can see, it just next to the nose there. She seems to be taking some very, 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 very significant breaths there. Just 
I haven't had my comms in. Bring my comms back in so that I can hear some questions. Don't know when that popped out. Wow, well, this is a fantastic sighting. Marisha on Twitter is saying, can I see the wow that's written on Corilla's forehead? Can you see that, Chandra? Yeah. Quite perfectly. Yeah. Wait till she turns to face us and have a look directly between her eyes and the forehead. You'll see it's written wow in this box. All right, guys, that's, that's incredible. So apparently, there's, I mean, there's a wow written on the top of her forehead. Yeah, it's actually easier than a spot pattern. Right? It's easier to tell than a spot pattern, as Jean is saying. Thank you very much, Marisha, for pointing that out. I don't think I've ever spotted a leopard in my life that has a wow written on the forehead. I don't think I'll forget that. And I think it definitely deserves that, eh, Karil? I think you deserve a wow on your forehead. You're a beautiful looking leopard. Okay, can I? Yeah, there it is. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Does it look like she's been hunting, Michelle's asking. Well, you know, it's quite difficult to tell. Often when a, a leopard has been hunting, it will breathe very, like, very much like this, but it is a very hot day today. So you can often, you can see that, you know, that could be a sign that it's, you know, hot, but it also can be a sign that she's fed. So I can't see her stomach at the moment. But I've, I've got a feeling that she might have fed. Uh, we'll have to have a look when we can get a better angle of her, angle of her at some point. Wow. And... <laughs> yeah. So Annie is saying that uh, it looks like she agrees. Jean is telling me to move the other way. There we go, I'm learning slowly but surely how to get good locations on the vehicle. <laughs> Thank you, Jean being such a, an amazing mentor. Um, so Annie's asking, well, saying that she agrees with me. Thank you, Annie, for agreeing with me. I'm glad that, you, that I have your support. I believe that, yes, she, it might be because she's been feeding that she's been breathing like, like this. But we don't know. It could be the heat, but when, when, we get a, when we get a good visual of her belly, we can, we can tell a little bit better on, on the scenario and, and actually kind of work out maybe what's, what's going on here. But the life of a leopard, I often... I just love to sit down with a leopard when I have the opportunity, just to kind of think what's the mindset, you know? I actually wrote... Uh, I did my dissertation. My dissertation at Schumacher College was called ecological learning through direct experience, which is based on how do we understand the natural world you know, through experiencing. A lot of the eco-literacy and the eco-learning that we get nowadays is in the form of some sort of theory. So we sit down in our classrooms and we sit down in our, in our bedrooms and we read about what is deep ecology, what is Gaia theory, what is systems thinking, you know, what does it mean to track an animal, what is, what is the mindset of, of something. And, and that gives us a very you know, cognitive understanding of the natural world. And, and so I wrote my thesis on how, how do we actually allow ourselves to have a direct experience and how does that change our view of eco-literacy and help us to understand the natural world a little bit better. You know, so I think a good, a good way of explaining is that is if with Karula here, if we, if, if we all went on a tracking afternoon and we'd have to really get into the mindset of, of, of the leopard to really understand where, where the leopard's going to be. You know? We can't just use our mind to find the leopard. We have to use our in, intuition. We need to use our sensory. We need to use the feeling aspects of ourselves in order to really understand. But, but on that, just on that note, you know, sitting here with, with this leopard and, and just you know, going into that mindset on how it influences its land landscape and how it's, what, what animals is it eating here? And, you know, what is the ecological service that it plays? And, you know, not just the service, I mean, that sounds terrible. Well, what is its influence on the landscape here? And what is its influence on the ecosystem at large? I love to think about those sort of things and to see 
how Karula might be influencing all the different types of animals here, because I can tell you that although Karula is eating all of the, well, eating the steenboks and the dakers, if it wasn't for her being here, there's a good chance that some of those animals like the steenbok and the daker wouldn't, wouldn't survive here, or would, would be, you know, they would overpopulate, this, overpopulate the place and kill all the vegetation. So what, what Karula actually helps in doing is to regulate those species and, and to create some sort of equilibri equilibrium in the bush. So while we sit here with Karula and, we, and, and this whole you know, story unfolds and how we learn a little bit more about her, we're going to go and see what Brent's doing. So let's, let's quickly have a, a, a look at what Brent's doing and we'll catch you just now. So we're still enjoying our time with this big Ellie bull. We just watched him destroy a tree to get a tiny patch of grass underneath. It was quite funny and then he moved off and the tree branches started cracking. He got a fright. He turned around and shook his head at the, at the non-existent threat from behind him. But we're not going to be able to see him too much longer. He is crossing through out of our traverse zone. There goes that big grey bottom. But what a fantastic sighting of that monster Eddie bull. There we go. As he heads off to the west, we're going to head further to the south. James Bear is wondering, are an elephant's testicles internal? Yes, James, they're actually right at the top of his back leg, about 20 centimeters below his spine. Now, many years ago, I was very fortunate uh, to be able to go out as an observer on the laparoscopic vasectomy of an African elephant. Now, they're using this as a management tool for elephant numbers in smaller reserves. So, in fenced smaller reserves, uh, they've tried lots of different things like hormonal treatments and that, and that tend to really mess with the elephant's social structure. So, the best way is to actually just give the, the bulls a snip. So, they'll, they'll snip a percentage of the bulls to keep the population curve uh, not rising too quickly so the reserve can deal with it. And it was an absolutely incredible experience. And I think uh, we did about nine or ten bulls in the space of about a week, but it is incredibly hard work and long hours, but a really incredible thing to watch. So those animals are, are darted from a helicopter uh, and then chased with that helicopter towards an area that's more open. Then the ground team comes in. And the ground team consists of a flat bay truck, a monster truck uh, with a crane. So then the elephant is put in a harness and lifted and hung next to the truck. So the vets are able to stand and have their computers on a table on top of the, on the flatbed of the truck. And they hang the elephant off there and they make a tiny incision and then put all that laparoscopic uh, equipment down there and then do the whole surgery by looking at a computer screen. Uh, it, is, it is absolutely amazing. Uh, definitely one of the stranger things I've witnessed in my time out in the bush. decision-making and sometimes when they're not in must they sort of amble about they don't really have a plan but when they're in must they're very 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 precise in what they want to do and where they want to go and we are being precise in our movements and we're heading towards impala plains but while we do that let's jump back to sam who's got karula on the move And we are back, everyone. Welcome back. We're going to follow on pursuit, hot pursuit, of beautiful Karula. This could be the moment, everyone, that we get a fantastic opportunity of seeing Karula and her cubs. 
I'm just gonna keep quiet every now and then, just because I wanna see if there are gonna be any calls. Kenny, how are you? Welcome to the show, Kenny. Seven years old, so awesome to have you here. Uh, we just... Oh, Penny. Penny, sorry, not Kenny. <laughs> uh, Penny, we are just... We're just gonna find out and see if the Cubs are with Karula. So we're gonna gently stroll behind Karula and see if she might be taking us to where the Cubs are. We just have to be quite quiet out here and see if we can slowly come round. I don't want to be too obtrusive. So let's just give her the space she needs. Wow. Wow, guys, this is unreal. There she goes, walking down Shabam Road. This is an unreal experience, everyone. To be going on foot or on car with myself and Jean Ray. Welcome. Jean Ray's first encounter with Karula together. I hope there's going to be many, many more. We hope. To be honest, Just into the tight. We're gonna follow Karula in to the bush felt and see if she can take us to her beautiful looking cubs. There she goes. Oof, she's, she's going to be walking a tricky line for us. But I just want to try and make it as slow as possible, as if they are cubs, that, if she is taking us to her cubs, then I don't want to be too much in their face as we arrive. Hold on, everyone. While we're following Karula, we're going to link back to Brett. We'll see you now. tracks around these parts this morning? Nope, I didn't. Did you come to these parts this morning? I don't think so. Ah. Oh, no, there's a, there's a, an ant lion hole in the one track. So, not too fresh. I think this could be the Birmingham's who disappeared into Arethusa very early this morning. Male lion tracks. And someone has skirted around to have a squiz with them. Uh, not fresh, unfortunately. Yeah, I did get a little excited there for a while. It's a hyena track on the top. It was a leopard track. I think this might be Karula's tracks, to be honest. Mm, nope. It's a hyena's tracks. This vast green mass in front of us in a few short months is going to be a completely different color. We are going to struggle to find a splash of green anywhere. Uh, 
absolutely stunning. This is one of my favorite viewpoints on Juma, just to sit here and look down the Mawati Valley. Listen to what birds you can hear. The moment you can hear some tiny little wax bulls. Quickly across to Sam and Karula. Hey guys. This is me sitting here with a wildebeest, which you can quite significantly see that she's he, sorry, the he, the wildebeest has seen Karula and he's making a very significant alarm call. I'm gonna see if we can find Karula again. Oh, she's gonna go down for something to drink. Awesome. I'm gonna go. Can you see from here? Should I try and get a better shot? There we go. Oh, the wildebeest is off. Karula's having something to drink. I'm gonna see if I can get a better shot of Karula. Oh, that is just magnificent. Have a look, everyone. Karula's having a sip in. Wow. Wow. Can you see that reflection of anyone? Is, is watching, can screenshot this, look at the reflection of her eyes in the water while she licks that water. That is a magnificent shot. Great, great camera work, Jean, right? Look at those eyes. Karula, it is so good to meet you. Thank you for sharing this amazing moment with you. Wow. Can you hear the sound of the bird? Can you hear the bird call, everyone? That is... That is amazing. You can hear the sound of the wildebeest making a noise, and you can hear the sound of the bird calls alarming all around us. I'm just going to call Brent. Brent, do you copy Brent? Brent, do you copy Brent? Brent, do you copy Brent? Well done, Sam. Uh, what's your position, Sam? Brent, we've just, uh, thank you very much. We are just coming down Shabam Road um, and we are at the junction, I think it is Tree House and uh, Shabam, I could be wrong, but we're at that junction and there's a significant watering hole and Karula is busy drinking at that watering hole now. Copy that, confirm general direction south uh, towards Gary Main. A firm. Copy, I'll shoot down and Gary Main, stand by there in case she does cross. Do you think she has got Nyamo somewhere behind? Hey, firm. Uh, Brent, we, we smelt a very significant smell. Uh, we, wasn't, we weren't sure if it was, uh, but we're gonna see if we're gonna follow her and see if she's gonna take us to a kill. Copy that. Welcome back. Sorry, guys, I didn't mean to to be delayed for so long, but we we're just communicating with Brent, and he is going to see if he can go to Gowrie Main and sit there and see if she might cross there. Uh, but we're just going to sit here with this beautiful sighting of Karula. She looks exceptionally thirsty, everyone. Have you noticed that? She is just sipping and drinking away there. It's been a long day for her. We saw her panting. And she, hey, Jean, as you agree that she looks quite full. Even though she's drinking a lot of water, she does look, she, like, she's quite a healthy looking leopardess. But that reflection in the water is something else.
it's, a, it's so great that we've been having some rain here in the Sabi, Sabi Sands over the last couple of weeks. It has provided a lot of much needed nourishment to both the ground and the mammals and the predators of the area. She's back on her feet. Ooh, and she's just gonna go find another place to drink some more water. And as you can see, there's another fantastic sighting there of the reflection of Karula in the water while she sips away there. Beautiful sighting here with this magnificent animal. We can still hear the sounds of the, the alarm calling bird to the left and right of us. The wildebeest hasn't made those noises anymore, so he's headed off. Colleen just asked her a great question, and that was, you know, why is it sometimes that the female won't be close to the cubs? And this is often because you know, it's much safer sometimes for the, for the mother to leave the cubs somewhere safe, in her den somewhere, and it could be that you know, she's denning. Brent's just here, so we're going to give some space to Brent. Um, we just, you know, often uh, the leopard, leopardess will, will leave her cubs somewhere which she knows that it'll be safe. Um, and this is often what she does. Colleen, it's a good, good protective way where she can go and catch meat, you know, fill up and, and look after herself before she comes back and looks after the cubs. You can imagine the, the job of looking after two young cubs is not easy for a, a mother leopard here in the bushveld. She's got to make sure that she can feed them with good food and get them some water and, and nourishment. And, in order for her to do that, she needs to not only go and hunt, but she needs to go and fill herself up with some liquid, as she's doing right now. So she's being a very clever mother, Karula. Diane asked, asked an interesting question on whether you know, she's still nursing her cubs uh, now that they're two months old and or they'll be eating solid foods. Um, my guess is that you know, she is still nursing them to a degree, but she's going to be trying to wean them off nursing um, and, and start getting them on solid food. Um, but that is something that we can, we can look up in the, in the mammals book to see the particular month that it is that they stop getting weaned. I reckon it's around two to three months that they stop being weaned. Let's have a look at the leopard. Here we go. Mm. Breeding, two to three. Cubs are born any time of the year after a gestation of three to three months, so there's actually no information here to the exact time that she does that. But I promise you, I'll look that up, and I'll next time we're with Karula, we can see, you know, we can have a look at some of the books and to see if she still might be nursing or not. But if you have the answer, please hashtag Safari Live, tweet us in. I'd love to know your your thoughts. But she's up again. She's stopped drinking. This is, yo, oh guys, my adrenaline is still pumping. I haven't been with a leopard for so long, especially an active leopard. It's so exciting. I can't tell you. I wish you could all be in the vehicle. You are in the vehicle with me. But this feeling of you know, smelling the, the bush felt and listening to the bird calls and listening to the alarm calls of the wildebeest and just generally watching her, the way in which she moves, it's just so, it's such a spect spectacle to be, to be a part of. She looks as if she's just looking around to see what might be around. Ooh. Let's see if I can get a nice framing of her from the other side.
Majum Major is asking an interesting question to, to the life expense, expectancy of. Uh, and they can actually live between 12 to 17 years old. The oldest leopard that I've ever encountered was, was a, a male leopard called Campan. He was at, at the Londolozi property and he was about 13 or 14 years old. He was a very, very old leopard that was coming to the end of its life. And often they will start moving to, oh, there's some zebras that are just coming in. Can you see those? No, they've just moved off. No, they've just moved off. You can't see them. I don't know if they, if they saw, there, there they are. Hello. Wow, so it's all happening again. Just as we were sitting at a watering hole this morning with all the different scenes that were unfolding, we are now sitting at another one. There's a whole different dynamic, a whole different story happening. Beautiful Karula sitting down by the watering hole. She's just had something to drink. If you've just logged into Safari Live right now, it's been a fantastic uh, afternoon so far. It was a beautiful morning as well. And now we can just see a, a zebra that is coming into screen. Hello, Mr. Zebra and Mrs. Zebra. Beautiful black and white stripes. Very significant African animal here in the Sabi Sands. As I was saying, if you've just logged in, it's been a fantastic afternoon. Myself and Jean-Andre were just driving down the via, uh, down Shabam Road, and I was looking to the side, and I noticed her tracks, and I just said, look, the tracks are here. Next thing, Jean-Andre was like, Sam, it's right in front of you, and I looked up, and there, the beautiful Karula was sitting and lying down right in front of me, almost, almost as if to say, hello, Sam. I've been waiting for you all afternoon. And there she was. Ellen Fowler, thank you so much for updating me with the, the age of this, this not so young leopard Karula. Thank you, and I really appreciate that. Um, the more that I can get to know these animals in the bush, carry on with uh, hashtag safari live and I'll bring that news to the other new viewers I know that I have a number of friends that have just um, started watching safari live and they would love to get to know a little bit more about the bush vulture and the leopards and all that sort of stuff so your information is really really helpful for me I'm sure every single other animal that is or sorry person that is logging into this fantastic channel of safari live we can still hear the sound of that bird. We can hear an alarm cord just off into the distance there. It's a beautiful, beautiful afternoon here in the, in the Sabi Sands. It's quite hot still. We're still experiencing some, some heat. But I'm just so curious, Karula, where are your cubs? Where are your cubs, Karula? I'd love to know where they are. I know that Brent is going to be waiting somewhere. Now, Karula, to see if maybe she will cross later on to see where the cubs might be. As in full. So I just heard that that Brent is going to go and see. Oh, there's Brent. Brent's going to go and see if there's a carcass. All right, so. She's lying down now. We, there's, there's a definite opportunity that the cubs might be around. And uh, Brent's going to go and see what he can find just around there while we sit with Karula. There goes Brent. Hello, Brent. Can't hear us right now, but he's going to go and track into the bushes to see if he can locate anything out there while we sit with, with Karula. Yo. Wow.
Paul on Twitter is asking, did that zebra even know that Karula was there? It's a fantastic question. I, I don't think that the zebra did, to be honest. I saw the zebra just getting up and walking across and not even taking, well, didn't notice it. I know that Karula noticed the zebra. Her head got up and she looked straight at the zebra. So I didn't, didn't notice the zebra taking. Did you see the zebra taking any notice of Karula, Jean? The wind's coming from the other side. Yeah, so no, great point, John. Really. The wind is coming from the other side, so it's not as easy for the zebra to smell the 12 year old leopardess that's in front of us. Karula. And we can still hear the sound of that. Ooh, Chandra, on top of the tree there, it isn't, it's a, that significant sound that we can hear is the sound of a squirrel. Look at that. Isn't that fantastic? Now that, everyone, is an iconic thing to see in the bush. It's often, you know, you'll hear a squirrel alarm called a leopard, and this, this squirrel is basically telling the savannah, listen, beneath me is Karula, and she's coming here. So you, I'm going to tell everyone. I'm going to get to the top of this tree and let everyone know that Karula's here. The queen of Juma is beneath the tree. So that's a, that's a very common thing that you'll see in the bush, is the sound of a squirrel. But I did hear some, some birds calling, alarm calling a little bit earlier. Hopefully, they'll come out into sight and we can identify them and see which one is the culprit for making all the noise for this beautiful leopard. It's a fantastic afternoon here with Karula as we've just we just slowly walked with her down the road here. And we noticed that she, she, she looked quite tired when we were sitting with her just now. And she took a gentle stroll down the road and came and had a drink down by the watering hole. And she definitely looks a lot fuller than she was um, a little bit earlier. And they, is, she is actually looking very full. Hey, Jean-Dre, what do you think? I've got a feeling that she's not only tired, but she's very full. And then often when, you know, when, you, when they've eaten, they actually get thirsty. So there's every chance that she's killed something, ate quite a bit of it, fell asleep on the road for a little bit and decided she needed some water. And the question is, where are the cubs? Where, oh, where are your cubs, Karula? I'd so love to be in the presence of those Wonderful looking creatures. Ooh. But Chandra, while we were coming down the road there, did you notice any other tracks other than her tracks there? Yeah, I only noticed her tracks there. We were following her tracks all the way down Shabam before we bumped her, and we would have seen the young cub's tracks that were following her if they were following her. So the chances are that they're actually not very close at the moment, but Brent, Brent Leo Smith is out there having a look to see if he can find the cubs, hopefully. He's an, a remarkable tracker, Brent. So he might just be out there having a look to see if he can find any remnants or any signs of the cubs. Hopefully, she might. What if you had a look at that? Oh, wow, everyone, have a look at those beautiful butterflies. If I'm not mistaken, are those African migrants? Do you know, Jean-André Jean is nodding his head in approval. So they are African migrants that also look like they've come down to the little water's edge to have something to drink. I forgot to mention a little bit earlier when we were, walk when you were with Brent, we followed Karula for a little bit longer and we noticed she actually changed and changed her path. She was heading in, in an easterly direction, and then she came across a buffalo, otherwise known as, well, Chandra was explaining as the one-eyed buffalo. And uh, I'm not sure, I think you guys might be acquainted with the one-eyed buffalo. I'm not acquainted with the one-eyed buffalo just yet. But she changed her course dramatically as soon as the, she came into contact with the buffalo. And so we could have been all the way down there following her, but the buffalo redirected her to this track, and now she's sitting with us at this watering hole. Watering hole over here. So that's 
So that is how the scene has unfolded thus far. We've had such a privilege of, of being able to watch both a giraffe and a leopard drinking by the watering holes today. The wilderness has definitely benefited us today, or given us much to look at. Uh, I guess there's always a lot to look at, but to be able to see a leopard in the wilderness is something very, very special, just because it's, you know, it's very difficult to see a leopard. And the Sabi Sands is known to be able to see a lot of leopard in many places in South Africa. It's very difficult to see one. And, and so sometimes I think we take it for granted you know, sitting with a leopard, and this is just such a great sighting, especially in this afternoon light with the African migrants that are just flying around us, some dipping in to the west, and the beautiful squirrels, alarm calling. What is it that you have? Ooh, is that a terrapin? Hello, Mr. Terrapin. Yes, it's, like, it's incredible that that's the one thing that I love about just sitting with an animal. You begin to see the world that exists around it. Uh, this leopard has brought us the opportunity to see a little terrapin and some, some beautiful-looking African migrants. Fantastic. I'll never forget on my, ter on my interview when I came down here, I was exceptionally nervous. Exceptionally, exceptionally nervous. I'm not sure if any of you guys were with me on that interview, uh, but I was... It's a much different feeling now as I'm sitting here talking to you to that feeling that I had when I first entered the bush vault and I had this camera behind me. Exceptionally difficult, but we came across some terrapins, and the terrapins made me smile, and just made just made me realise that I was out here. I was out here to show people wildlife, so it got me quite excited. Once you get out here and you start showing animals, it's not as scary as it seems. If any of the youngsters are watching out there, um, Gracie, who's eight, and I think it was Mike, and a few of the others, it was a Penny that was seven. It's, it's not as difficult as you think, you know, the more that you get yourself in front of a camera and talk to the lens and be given the opportunity to share wilderness with people, it's a very special thing. So I encourage any young person to, to pursue this and to, to share the wilderness with anyone. It's a fantastic thing to do. But hopefully, as the afternoon progresses, Karula's going to get back on her feet potentially show us a little bit more about what is going on around it. Jerry, if you copy, I've put my comms back on. Wow. Michael, who is 13 years old, fantastic to have you here with us in the African bush vault. It's been an incredible journey thus far. And you're asking, what do I need to study in order to be a safari guide in the bush? You know, Mike, I only realized that I wanted to become a safari guide. You know, I never, as growing up as a kid, wanted to be a safari guide. It happened because of my interest with the natural world that created the outcome that I was going to be a safari guide. And uh, what that was, was just my interest in understanding ecological systems or, or geography or you know, understanding felt or mountains or geology. You know. So geology, geography, biology are all little things that you can do. But to be honest, school just gives you a tool for learning. You know, real learning is doing it yourself and understanding it yourself. So wherever you are in the world, if you're interested in becoming a safari guide one day, take an interest in whatever ecology you are, you know. At school we sometimes learn things in separation and you don't need to study geography in order to, to become a safari guide. You just need to study life, really, to become a safari guide. All it, guide, all it is really is, is to be interested more about the world that you live in and that's what's given me the you know the love for for doing this and and, and use, using my time and my energy to do something like this is just because I've been interested in the natural world and I'm sure it'll be a different story for Brent and a different story for Jamie and a different story for James. We're all born in different contexts and it's 
It's the way in which you perceive the world. So my, my advice is just to keep being yourself and, and try your best. So it's been a fantastic afternoon. I tell you, I've been sweating, and my adrenaline's been everywhere since we first saw Karula at the beginning, when she gave me that fright. I'm glad that she's given us such an eventful afternoon, from the wildebeest to the sounds of the squirrel on the tree. With that, we're going to go and see what Brent is doing with the elephants. See you now. Well, it seems to be a day for elephant bulls for us. Look at this. A slightly younger, but by no means less impressive boy, breaking the lower branches of a marula tree. And you can see his tusks are quite a bit skinnier, and he's still a very large animal. Oh, oh! Sometimes they actually climb up onto their back legs. I thought he might do that for a second there, but no such luck this time. And you'll notice most of the marulas in these parts are very well maintained and groomed and it's at elephant bull height <laughs> generally so, so the leaves above where an elephant bull can reach seem to survive quite well and anything below as you can see is kept clear giving these wonderful shapes of to these trees Stretching. Look at that. <laughs> they can be quite messy feeders. Oh, 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 is he going to do it? Look at that little, the, the little bend in the back knee. I thought he might leap. I think he's just going to pull the whole tree down. That's much easier <laughs> than having to jump up onto your, yeah, your back legs. So Jesse's wondering, do they ever get some stuff stuck in their teeth like we do in our gums, and does it ever hurt them? Well, Jesse, an elephant's tooth uh, on the inside, it's almost a big single tooth. And uh, that big boy we saw earlier did have a little bit of foliage stuck in his, in his tusk around there, but it didn't seem to bother him at all. And I think their mouths are much tougher and far more designed uh, to be able to take on much rougher food than we would. So I don't think it troubles them nearly as much, not to say that it can't happen, it's just less likely. of these bulls they are so wonderful to spend time with. Okay, I'm just going to try. Oh, come on, over the bump. Couldn't make it. No. Um, well, 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 just, I'm just going to start the car for a second. Always important to let the car run for a little bit nice and relaxed with us before we move. What I want to do is just pop over this little bump and then we're going to switch off the road again. I'm going to get over the bump. There we go. So William, who's in Potchefstroom, South Africa, is wondering how old is an elephant when he gets onto his last set of teeth. And normally around Probably, they probably get onto that last set of teeth um, in their mid to late 40s. But uh, they're completely sort of done at the oldest, sort of mm, 60. And normally by mid 50s, they've sort of completely utilized that last set of teeth. And now it always, it always depends on what area they're in. Sorry, I, I saw something in the distance there. Yep. And so it depends on what their food sources are, what are they eating, 
uh, will also depend on how, how much they wear down their teeth. So elephants that eat more grass and live in like big open grasslands like the Serengeti or Masai Mara uh, tend to have a slightly longer lifespan as the grass isn't as wearing on their teeth as breaking branches like our guys do. of the branch. That wasn't him breaking, that was actually him chewing. And with really soft wood like this, you'll often see them actually breaking off branches, which you won't see them do too often. They'll actually chew the whole branch through now, Marula is quite a soft wood. It's not a very hard wood. It enables them to do that. And you might do it shortly. Just break off one of those little branches that are left there. And not only the leaves, but you will also eat the branches, the smaller, skinnier branches like those ones there. You'll munch them whole. that one I'm gonna wrap, wrap this trunk around and there we go I'm gonna hear the crunch now isn't that incredible to hear that <coughs> as he munched through that branch Yeah, occasionally whacks his trunk through to his ears and that and he's chasing away the flies that also going to be irritating him although less so with that really incredibly thick skin they have He's actually just coming into mice. There's a very slight dribble starting from the penal sheath. There we go. And he's probably very early must in comparison to the other bull who we saw was in proper full must. So looks like the big boys who are going to be out competing for the ladies are all out and about at the moment. sound you actually hear quite often out in the bush is that doof, doof. and that's that flapping of the ears if you listen listen very carefully out in the bush you'll hear that doof, especially on hot days so guys it's going to be on the game drive quickly afternoon uncle mark and um, there's a nice one on and love on the link from quarantine down towards uh, the Vuitella Dam. There uh, are currently, I think, three stations with Karula, two standing by, and Shabam Junction with a treehouse quite close to Gari Main. And I think there was a Shabam and Love somewhere on Vuitella Dam a bit earlier. incredible we could hear him chewing it is amazing so he's probably 10 meters from us give or take a meter or two 
And Monique's wondering if it's because he's after fiber. Uh, not really, Monique. He's after the, the nutrients in that sort of cambium layer. But because it's such a soft wood, he'll chew through it all. Oh, look who else is walking into the, into the picture. Nice male in Yala. Looks like he might pass that elephant. Now, when these Ellie bulls are in must, they sometimes do chase all the other animals around in Yala and Parla, wildebeest, zebra. Oh, little dust bar. It must have been about this time last year that Brian and I were at Buffalo's with Dam, and an elephant bull, probably about the same size as that one we saw at the beginning of the safari actually covered us in dust and he was also in must so there seems to be at this time of the year in this area the big bulls come into must so that means there'll be uh, quite a few females in estrus so the big bulls only come into must at the time when there's a lot of females in estrus and the smaller bulls generally come into must outside of that time so they don't have to compete with these big boys So he's definitely an adult, probably quite a bit younger. I'd say he's about 30, 35. Bella says, is it just me or does he look half asleep while he's eating? Oh, he's very much awake, but he's just very relaxed. sitting quietly and listening to a big elephant bull's ears flap and chewing on the trees. Now, you often find that little white spot corner of an eddy's eye and that's just normally dust build up uh, from during the day and especially as it gets dry you'll notice that more and more often One of those bigger pieces of branch again and that soft wood he's just going to crunch it wonders if there is anything to the, the myth of the elephant graveyard. Unfortunately, not at all. That was a, a wonderful story uh, by, I think it was Ryder Haggard, uh, who wrote the book King Solomon's Mind and that mythical elephant graveyard. It doesn't exist, I'm afraid. Uh, elephants generally tend to die around pans or water sources uh, towards the end of their life when their teeth are really worn down. They become very very dependent on that water and quite often they actually might drown because they're just too weak to even lift their trunk out of the water but there's no such thing as an elephant graveyard i'm afraid although many an early victorian explorer expired out in the african wilderness in search of the elephant's graveyard now the character alan quarterman was immortalized in those stories about the interior of africa
some kind of woods. He's here. Every minuscule little sound he makes, the ears flapping, he's crunching, the occasional bout of flatulence. wondering, are there any external or was it just the pheromones in the air? Judy, sometimes they'll excrete from the, the glands just behind their eye, uh, but that can also be from stress or other hormonal issues. So not really, not like a male where you can definitely smell and see he's in must. amazing when we first spotted him he was a little bit unrelaxed but we just stopped a little bit further away first and then just come came in slowly slowly and now he's very relaxed in our presence now occasionally elephants do lie down and monkey in virginia was wondering about that generally the younger animals uh, will spend more time lying down but i have once upon a time on foot found a massive elephant bull probably bigger than this guy, fast asleep, snoring on a termite mark. It was sort of a... And my tracker who was with me, who spent many, many years in the bush as well, also had not a clue what that sound was. We actually found him lying in a little sort of runoff area, so with a nice steep bank up against the termite mound. Now, if a big bull like this were to lie down on his side, it'd be very difficult for him to, to get back up. So when they do lie down, they generally try to find a convenient termite mound or a fallen tree to, to have a snooze under. But these big boys can often be found sort of sleeping with their, their heads resting against a big tree. They do most of their, their resting standing up rather than lying down. We're going to spend a bit more time with this beautiful big boy. Uh, but in the meantime, Sam is going to make space for the other game drive vehicles to have a look at the Queen of Juma. So let's go have a last look at her. Welcome back, everyone. I heard that you guys have had an incredible time with Brent and the elephants and what else you've seen on your journeys with Brent. We've had a fantastic time here with Karula. As you can see, she is still fast asleep but breathing very heavily, and we can see that she has been feeding. So her stomach is rather large. With that, there's a number of other people that are wanting to come into the sighting, so we're going to leave Karula. Uh, no worries that we didn't get to see her cubs. We've been so privileged to have seen them in the last week already. So hopefully, as time comes, we'll be able to see a little bit more of you, Karula. I'm very grateful for the sighting I've had with you, and hopefully in the, in the not-so-distant future, we can see the cubs with you. So with that, let's get going. <laughs> Leaving sighting with Karula underneath the Balanites on Shabam. Uh, there are two stations now present at the site. I must say, everyone, I wish you could just get the feeling a little bit of what it's like to be up in this front seat, trying to deal with all the different complexities as it is to be a safari guide. We just had the conversations about what it would be like to be a safari guide. And it's not an easy task, um, especially when you haven't had practice in, in such a long time. You've got to manage 
the different vehicles that are coming in. I didn't do so well at managing the vehicles coming in now. It's all a very much a learning game at the moment. It's not even the roads. I mean, I think I know what road this is. Um, I think it could be... It could be Trias. It could be Trias Road. I'm not too sure. But it doesn't really matter, does it? At the end of the day, we're, we're driving through the beautiful bush while it's having a fantastic time. Wow. Virginia just asked, do I ever go on a road and often not feel familiar with where I am? Well, that's currently happening right now. <laughs> um, Virginia, I love, that's probably my favorite feeling in the whole world, is to be lost. And I'm not saying that, like, it's true. I really like being lost. I know that sounds ridiculous. When I was in the Amazon, and I was living on the Amazon with a, with a little, in a community just to the south, we went to Belém, which if you have a look on the map, you'll see Belém is where you enter the Amazon River. Um, I was very privileged to have gone there to study some of the indigenous communities on the Amazon last year and to understand how development's impacting them. And when I was just on the river, a little south down the river, I was staying in a beautiful community. Uh, and I'm just forgotten the name of the, uh, okay, it's called Altamira. That's what the name of the little city is. And we, from Altamira, we went down further on the Amazon and I got the unique opportunity to just jump into a, into, a, into a little canoe, and I canoed down little estuaries where I got so super lost. And I can tell you that the Amazon is full of many different types of animals that can be quite scary, especially when you're on your own. But Virginia, it's always a great thing to be lost because you never really are lost because no two tree is different, and so once you look around you and you start to understand your ecological systems that are around you from the sun, which is heading in the west, and the sun that rises in the east, we can always understand a little bit about where we are. All we have to do is look outside of ourselves and we can figure it out. But with that, let's actually see what Brent's up to. I'd love to see what he's doing. Well, I can't really see, but I'll be able to hear through the viewers what he's up to. Have a fantastic time with Brent, and we'll see you just now. There we go. That Ellie's just moved off and he's about heading directly towards that dead knobthorn tree. And on top of that dead knobthorn, we noticed there was an African green pigeon. And they were calling, making that very, very distinct, as I can only describe it, it sounds like a, a dial-up internet call. If uh, some of our younger viewers might not know what that is, but sort of uh, when you have to get onto the internet, uh, that's what they sound like when they call. I'll keep a listen out, see if he does it again. But let's move around so we can keep up with this Ellie. Well, it seems like Ryan and I are enjoying some quality elephant bull time with this sunset safari. You can see that lovely late afternoon light starting to catch his tusks. moved on from destroying marula trees to a bit of grazing. So, Maju Major on YouTube says, what does musk smell like? Like the Axe body cologne. Uh, no, and uh, how would you describe it? It's a little sweet. Mm. A sweet, a very, ah, it's a very distinct smell in the bush. Uh, a sweet, musky oil. <laughs> Sorry, I know that doesn't help anyone. I thought it was quite funny, though. Um, oh, I don't know how to describe musk. It's, very it's a very difficult smell to describe.
Chris in Cape Cod is wondering, every so often an elephant will lift and wave its foot. Why do they do that? Well, Chris, you could probably ask the same question. Why does a person crack their knuckles? Why does uh, you stretch? It's probably just stretching that joint a little bit and taking a little bit of pressure off it. I don't think there's any particular reason they do it. You can see, I mean, there you can see he's taking a little bit of weight off the one foot. Maybe just resting it a little bit. There we go. See, and he was resting that before he placed it. I don't think there's any particular reason, just because it feels nice or feels a little bit more comfortable. There we go. Did you hear that? That was the, uh, the green pigeon doing the internet dial-up sounds. And there are a couple of other birds up there as well. There's a glossy starling, and a red-billed oxpecker to the right, and another oxpecker to the left. I was hoping he might meander down towards the pan or towards the dam for another mud wallow. It looks like he has had one today, but it was a while ago. I was hoping now that it's hot, he might slowly move down there and spray himself full of mud. There we go. You can see he's taking weight off the front left now, and then down again. So, elephants have a very diverse diet and they eat lots of different things. And Alistair in Johannesburg is wondering, is there anything an elephant won't eat? And uh, what is their favorite thing to eat? Well, it, what they completely depends on the time of year for what their favorite thing to eat is, but specifically when there's certain plants fruiting, for example, the marula fruit, that is definitely a favorite. And when there is nice grass around, uh, grass is also one of their favorites. Oh, it's itchy ear. Yeah. Uh, what they won't eat, they won't eat some of the wild flowers that are quite high in toxins. I'm trying to think what I have never seen them eat. Now, one must remember that a lot of this behavior can be very different from a, another area. You very seldom see them eat terminalias here because they've got so much combretum and, and, and marula and other stuff to eat. But in, in other areas, they actually absolutely flatten uh, terminalias. But it's something they seldom eat here. But, oh, he's on the move again. I think it's something that won't be here. Definitely never seen them eat quite a few of the different wildflowers, the heliotropes and that. I've seen them eat devil fawns, not only here but in other places, but here they only seem to eat devil fawns when they're a little bit stressed. So when we went through that very dry period, uh, they were feeding quite a lot on the devil fawns. like quarries or spike bush or spike thorns but they do eat them so jackal berries they might eat the fruit but you don't ever really see them eating the tree uh, specifically once they're adults oh there he is which is that way he's after something else
try and get around the light. It would be a bit difficult from here. Or we could go with the back, that elephant. What would you like, Brad? I'm going to try the back lid. Let's try the back lid, Eddie. You should get a little head shake at us. Hello, big boy. Oh, my goodness, did you see that, Brian? Oh, and out again. Lilac breasted roller. Okay, guys, he's really close to us now. Hello, big boy. They are just the most incredible animals. So I think he's going to head off either in search of something more to eat or maybe some ladies. He's out on five legs at the moment. But when I was going, ooh, ooh, Brian, as he walked past the front of us, this lilac breasted roller literally nearly landed in the car and it's flown back to its perch there. Here we go. Hello, Mr. Roller. Or oh, Mrs. Roller. And obviously, we disturbed uh, a grasshopper or an insect as we were driving. And that roller saw it and decided, no, yeah, I'll take a chance. Such a beautiful bird. The national bird of Botswana. Now, there's a, one of the sort of first safari guides up in Kenya and then moved down to Botswana. And he was guiding in the 60s. He, he has a pet hate for the lilac breasted roller. So we see quite a lot of them here, but in northern Botswana, there's probably three times the amount you see. So every 50 meters down the road, there's another lilac breasted roller. Um, and he. He's nicknamed them the Nabba, and it stands for not another something, not another bleep, roller. So when, when he'd been safari guiding for 35 years, and every, every, every person makes you stop for every third roller, uh, he, he got to the stage when he was done with rollers. He said he used to refuse to stop for another lily breasted roller. He would just keep going past them. Oh, sorry, he didn't see it. It flew away. Oh, sorry. And he's quite the character, one of the sort of legends in the safari industry. Not another roller. Oh, it's on the hunt. Great camera work, Brian. What's he got? What's he got? What did you get? Greedy guts, you swallowed it before you could see. So this is very typical of a roller's sort of hunting strategy. Find a nice, relatively open perch in some grassland, and then just keep an eye out for any little insect that moves. light coming through from the left. We've got monkeys alarm calling. Mm. Close to the lodge. Let's go have a look. There's a Nyala also all of a sudden look quite alert. Maybe there's another leopard around. Or could the Nkuhumas be on the way out? Again. Oh. Uh, 
thanks very much. I'm just uh, following up quickly on some cow alarm calls around Vuyatela. Otherwise, I'd like to join you there. Surprise, surprise. Uh, I can't hear any more monkey alarm calls. Hello. And they've gone quiet. Maybe they had a sighting. They do do that sometimes. The Nyala up ahead look very relaxed. So I've just heard about a, a treat that we weren't definitely not expecting. And I'm going to start speeding towards it because it is in an area that if whatever that treat is gets moving, it could disappear. Hello, Nyalas. speed off in that direction. Uh, let's jump back on board with Sam and see what he's up to. <clears throat> we have just had the most spectacular sighting of a, tr a tree squirrel. It was fantastic. Huh? It was incredible to watch these little, um, you know, they go really quickly. So you were with Brent at the spectacular sighting of the elephants just now. <laughs> Yeah, so there isn't a bird in the car, it's just my device. <laughs> but um, no, it was fascinating. I really enjoy squirrels. As I told the viewers earlier this morning, or I told you this morning, that it was, it is a, a squirrel that's my favorite um, animal. And so we just sat with this tree squirrel that was jumping. It's amazing to watch them jump and move from tree to tree and go into little, branches was, uh, was incredible. So hopefully we'll get to see another tree squirrel. I'm sure we will. They're everywhere. Just got to look hard for those little movements. But we've had a spectacular day. I'm, I'm feeling very, very content, very full, just like Karula was next to that watering hole, of, of such, such incredible experiences of wilderness all in one, one particular day. So the afternoon light is very much upon us now. It's been a very hot, hot, hot day. The temperatures decreased by quite a bit. What we're gonna do, myself and John Ray, are gonna move through this thicket here. Maybe, we'll, I'm suspecting maybe we'll see a Nyala or a Kudu before we enter onto the cut line. And once we're on the cut line, we're gonna uh, head down towards Cheetah Plains where it's a much different environment for both Kudu and Nyala. We'll go and see if we can see a beautiful sunset. And in that sunset, there could very well be a cheetah in the, in the plains. Uh, but that's being very optimistic. And I like to live in optimism. So, Jandre, do you reckon we'll see a cheetah on the cheetah plains as the sun dips into the west? What is your, do you want, we said that about Karula a little bit earlier, didn't we? We're gonna have to drive very fast. Oh. <laughs> now, Jean just said we're gonna have to, drive a little bit quickly to, to be able to get a, a good shot of that sunset. Rick is asking, what do we do when we see an animal that looks very sick out in the bush? Do we treat them or we did, do we let nature be? From my experience, from what I understand of the, you know, the way in which things work in, in the bush, we, le we let things go as they are. You know? Yesterday I saw a impala that would look very injured on its back um, and it was moving much slower than, than the herd itself. And that'll, of course, within the next few weeks, be eaten by either a, a cheetah or a, a leopard or a lion. And, you know, it's just the way the world works out here in the bush. It's, you've got to let nature be, and to interfere with it would be to sticking your hand in some pie that you don't need to. So in the bush here, we let things act out as they should. And that, I think that should be the policy. I think that's a very important policy to, to not int intervene in nature too much. 
of course, when, when human environments intervene to an extent where we create a bite or we introduce a, a disease that shouldn't be here, such as rabies or something, we need to make, uh, act decisively in order to, to try and stop the spread of diseases. That's when humans will have an intervention. But when it comes to you know, uh, some, an injured buck or, or a sickly looking buck, then we'll leave that. Well, it's an interesting question. We just saw something walking across the road there. Was that a water buck? It was a water buck, everyone. Beautiful. We'll be able to see. Can you try and get close up on that genre? Is it quite hard to get it while I'm driving? I'll see if I can get closer. And we can have a look at the significant features of a water, water buck. And let's see, it's going to be close to all. There's not just one, there's two, there's three, there's more than three, there's four, there's five, there's six. There's, wow. We've got a whole, Jeepers, what do you call a group of water buck? Does anyone know the answer? If anyone knows the answer to this, please let us know. I very nearly drove onto that property, and that wouldn't have been very positive. But this is a very typical thing to see. Water buck close to a watering hole. We can see the females are very are close to the males, so they're not just on their own. They've got a there's a very big male on the right there. If we just have a look at him, there he is. Look at those horns. You just see them in the distance there. He's a very big, strong built male. That will be most li likely looking after this harem of females and youngsters. But it's, it's said, or oh, look, look at the one just looking at us now, there are such beautiful animals, these water buck. You can see that significant white circle at the back. That is, as we are quite well aware, is, is something to help identify, the youngsters to identify each other out here and, and to follow them. It helps with um, the way in which they can follow each other. But they're very significant, those, those round circles on the back. And from what I remember, waterbuck have a very oily substance on them, which is actually quite stinky, if I'm correct. It's a type of well, it's something that, that helps deter uh, predators from eating waterbuck. It's an adaption that they've evolved over the millions of years or the thousands of years. It's an incredible afternoon here with these water buck, that light is so amazing. And, I, and with that light, I want to see if I can get a, a better view of the sunset. So let's keep going. I'm sure we're going to have much time to spend with the water bucks in the future. I can tell you a beautiful story about them one day when we're sitting with one. But for now, let's try and get to a position where we can watch the sun go down, and let's see what Brent's up to. Just for now. So we've arrived at the treat, and the treat, of course, is the African sunset, or is it? Of course it's the sunset, and we are treated most days of the year to this beautiful, beautiful light. And if we look just below the setting sun, there's a very hot and uncomfortable looking male lion. One of the Birmingham boys. Now, there's three of them here. We've only got visual of one at the moment, but there are three in this area. Now, strangely enough, this is probably about 60 meters from where we found that big Ellie bull we started following. I'm sure they would have been keeping a low profile to try and stay away from these big, or these big boys would have been trying to stay away from that big elephant. that herd of buffalo Sam had on the sunrise safari were probably about 100 meters from where they were sleeping, those buffalo. So I think the buffalo have made their timely departure during the warm hours of the day. And 
wonder whether these lions will be up and following them. Or preferably for us, we'll march down via teleaccess to quarantine and try and chase the buffalo at the pan. Our male lions have a better success rate at hunting buffalo herds just because they're so much bigger and so much more powerful than the lionesses. Sorry guys, just listening to the game drive channel. Let's try and get you a slightly better view. a little bit hungry but more than that he's just looking a bit hot and you can see on the spine there starting to show he could be the birmingham boy that uh, was incorrectly thought to be on death door a while ago uh, i mean he's skinny but in, for a male lion he's on by no means a death's door that heavy panting is probably from the heat he could be carrying some injuries i mean male lions are literally in a veritable war constantly with each other with other males so they do go through patches where they look a little worse for wear and by no means would i say he's on death's door and considering where he was on death's door and where he is now he's walked a very long way for someone who was about to die So we're definitely going to be sitting out for the long haul here. Hopefully they're going to get moving as the sun dips below the horizon. And maybe we'll even be lucky enough to be treated to some vocalizations. Nice thing about as we head to the cooler weather, so Lorraine's wondering if he has a bad eye. Not that I can see Lorraine. Uh, he looks like he might have a few scars around. Might have had a few smacks in that area, but definitely not. any a bad eye. You can see both his lower canines still intact. He's got all his front incisors or lower front incisors. Until he yawns, we're not going to be able to see if he's got all the top half. Kitty. 
So we will go have a look at the other two boys, but he's the only one with his head up from what I can see at the moment. Coalitions are, are fantastic things. Now, when they first move into area, they cause a lot of destruction. Lots of dead cubs, dead lionesses, pandemonium, panic, roaring, fighting. But once they become settled, and a big coalition like this generally hangs around for a few years, which gives a chance for those prides to recover from all the casualties they might have had from a, a group of males like this. So. Head's getting heavy again. So it's going to be great having these guys around. It means we should have some stable cubs, some stable prides, therefore some nice sets of cubs around for the next little while at least. And you never know for certain. And that's one of the things about the, about the bush. It could change tomorrow. New males might arrive who might be bigger and stronger than the Birmingham's. But I think they're probably set for the foreseeable future at least. wondering do big cats ever fight each other uh, for example a lion and a cheetah well it wouldn't be much of a fight rick a lion is weight wise probably 300 plus pounds bigger than a cheetah and a cheetah would definitely not try to fight a lion and try to run away from a lion so would a leopard try to run away uh, so would wild dogs so would uh, even a big clan of hyenas wouldn't take on a male lion they would harass some females but not an adult male lion sorry guys just got to be on the game drive standing by hey, Firm, i think he's the one who's actually next to me at the moment uh, the other two are, were in hoffman's this morning i mean he's he's looking skinny but not that bad about that so that was just someone else wondering if this was the lion that was called on very ill a few days ago and as i said he is, isn't looking the best but not too bad but back to cats fighting so the biggest fight a lion will ever have is definitely against another male an amazing thing to witness and they'll even fight amongst each other so these five coalition members will fight for mating rights, fight for food. But if there was any interloper coming in, they would band together to fight that intruding male. And he's really struggling to keep his head up. He's very tired. It's very hot, very uncomfortable. And you see his ears are constantly ticking to try and battle those flies. Why don't you just put your head down, big boy? Stop, uh, stop fighting it. <laughs> he 
Here we go. Just lie down. No, head up again. Seems determined not to nap flat. Well, this lion battles its eyelids. Let's jump back on Sam with Sam to have a look at the sunset. The African sun, magnificent sight as we sit here in the Sabi Sands. It's been an incredibly eventful afternoon. I've told that you've just been sitting with the male lions. How exciting. Female leopard and then sitting with male lions with Brent. Wow. Just taking the tranquility of the sunset against the backdrop of the Drakensberg Mountains. You can see an array of colors there from the shining red. If you can just see that shine of red that's glowing onto the Drakensberg in the distance there with a few other colors that are coming from it. Some purples, some pinks, some violets, some rose. It's truly magnificent. And just as we spoke this morning, the crisp air, myself and Brian were smelling next to the buffalo herd. The crisp air is back as the evening begins to come through. The sounds of the night animals are starting to come out with the beautiful night jars, the fiery neck jars, coming out with their beautiful cause to tell us that the evening is upon us. It's incredible to stop the day with the sign of the sun, to watch it go down. What a magnificent planet we live on. And that sun tells us such, an, such a significant story of, of life on Earth and how everything has evolved over time from this beautiful tree that we are seeing here, the life that it once lived, the birds that once to live, that used to live in its branches, to the soil that was beneath it, and to the soil that is beneath the soil, the fossils that are beneath all of that other soil. <laughs> it's just magnificent, really, when you stop to think about life on Earth and how great it all is, the story that is unraveling every single day. Such a privilege to be witnessing it live on camera with Jean Ray, out in the bush with Brent, who's been such an incredible guide to work with over the last couple of weeks. Thank you to the directors at the backstage. Wow. Wow, it's incredible. Incredible, just take a look at the sun, everyone. Think about all the food you've eaten, everything that this sun has provided. It gives us everything in life. An incredible, incredible sun. And with that, let's link to another position where we can see the sun from another angle. See you now. Look at that gorgeous view through the quarries. As we head further into the dry season with more dust and whatnot about, the sunsets are going to get more and more spectacular. And it's always slightly better when there's two male lines just underneath. So. Here we go, two other coalition members. And you can see they're in slightly better nick than the other poor boy. Not quite as skinny. not many animals in the African bush who can sleep like a male lion. They have perfected the art. And there's very few things that will get them to stand up. 
One is a breeding herd of elephants. Or an elephant bull, we might chase them. But other than that, if we look carefully at the grass all around here, you can see all he's done is sort of flop from side to side to side. And you can see how the grass is flattened, where he's being lying at a different point of the day. If, you, if we come up this way, Brian, around his head, you can see how it's been flattened further in when obviously it was more sunny. And I can't really see where this guy was sleeping, but it'll be around somewhere. You'll find a flattened grass. Now, lions are one of the few animals when you find tracks sort of this massive flattened area of grass or flat like this. Uh, lions are one of the few animals that leave a sign like that. Um, even with big herds of buffalo, you always find gaps between the flattened area, but not where a group of lions has been sleeping. incredible and you just see that latent energy that incredible power that muscles as they move through and if we ever get to see a male lion at full speed it is truly a sight to behold and rick welcome to safari live uh, rick said he's just discovered this stream and this is incredible and thanks for the game drive well thank you for joining us rick don't forget you can join us twice a day um, from 6 a.m. Central African time to 9, p uh, 9 a.m. Central African time and uh, from 3.30 p.m. Central African time to 6.30 p.m. Central African time. Twice a day and, of course, rotating through, you will have a host of different presenters, myself and Sam, and then James and Jamie as well. And we love having you guys on the back. We love sharing our passion and knowledge for the African bush and spreading the word of conservation. A little known fact about lions, there's probably less than 20,000 lions left in the wild. Sorry, guys, I just need to be on the game drive. Standing by. AFM, um, the only station here. Best access is off Vuyatela Access, probably about 60 meters to the west of junction with Impala Road. Oh, look at that. Brian, see if you can get that blood color. And it's coming, look at that. As the sun's about to sink below the horizon, there's that orb disappearing through the guari bushes. I always love this transition, whether it be this, from dark to light or from light to dark. It is definitely the most special time of the day. And now the temperature is going to start cooling. And hopefully these animals are going to get moving shortly. So Mr. Tuvok is wondering if a lioness was already pregnant before a male lion takeover, would the cubs be killed? Or would the ma new males think they're theirs? Generally, the females, if they are pregnant, would try to avoid the new males. Oh, look, a little eye twitch there. Uh, but normally those cubs would get killed. And as soon as those cubs were killed, it immediately brings 
the females into estrus again, so enabling the new sets of males to mate with them. In a lot of cases, it is a false estrus. So the reason lioness do this is uh, they're genetically programmed to have a false estrus after losing cubs to new males. And the reason being is that they don't want to put all that effort and energy into getting pregnant to lions that are going to be ousted quickly. So they generally wait one or two estrus cycles before they mate for real, so to speak, to have cubs. The Birmingham's have, have been in, in charge ooh, for quite a while now, I'd say prob prob probably properly since October. October, November. So I think safe to say that they are definitely going to be uh, in charge for the next while and those lioness will start mating. Now, that does not mean once they're in charge that all the cubs that are born are theirs. In a lot of areas, up to 50% of the cubs born to a pride are not from the dominant coalition. They belong to sneaky single male lions who haven't formed or joined coalitions and they run around on the peripheries getting the, taking any half chance they get uh, to mate with a female. So without genetics, it's near impossible to actually say who the fathers are and that goes for most big cats out in the wild uh, the females will often mate with multiple males to ensure the best chance of survival for those cubs oh stretch and no no rollover i thought we might get a stretch and roll we just got a little leg stretch my shoulder. No, other guys still dozing just off to the right. Unfortunately, just out of shot behind a quarry bush. So from three lions, they are as flat as a pancake, to a leopard who's as flat as a pancake. Karula is still lying very much in the last position that we left her. She is so tired. She looks like she's been sleeping there. Oof, yeah, no, she's tired. And what I've just heard is that you've just been with some other big, flat pancakes, the beautiful male lions with Brent. How exciting. I have, still haven't seen a, a male lion here on the property. I'm sure that my time is coming. It's been an eventful day, so to be honest, I'm very happy with everything that's been going on so far. But to just look at this beautiful looking leopard lying against while she rubs her face, on the pan where she had a drink of water earlier, which gave us much excitement. Me and Jandre were the first ones to find Karula. And she was, that was an exciting few moments in my life. And I can still tell you that the excitement is still there, purely also because, you know, it's the first time me and Karula, but also, you know, I've been getting fed some, some facts on, from Jandre, who's been telling me a little bit more about Karula, as well as the, you viewers have been helping me so much with learning a little bit more about this cat. It's fascinating to hear the stories and the life cycle of this very, very well-known leopardess here in the Sabi Sands. And you know, the, the evening has many, many, many ways in which it could turn. We could potentially leave Karula sleeping here, but also we have the opportunity, maybe the, or the potentiality of watching Karula get back 
on her two feet. You know? Oh, look at her just washing the flies away from her face. That is, must be very, very annoying, as flies. You can see her ears flicking, flicking there. But eventually, I feel, I think she'll, you know, she doesn't look like 100% full. I would say she looks about 70% full, 80% full. If there's any chance that she's going to grow a little bit more hungry, and uh, we're going to watch her get up and move, move away, hopefully. Um, I'm hoping, but if she just relaxes here and has to sleep in front of us, I have absolutely no problem with that. If she moves, I think my guess is that she's going to get up next to the watering hole. She might have another little sip of water, and she's going to move onto the tracks or onto the road. I reckon she's going to walk towards our boundary line over into the little gallery, and that will be the last that we see of Karula today. She could potentially be go off to see her, her cubs wherever they're denning. Uh-oh. Ellen Fowler has just updated with me, or updated me that um, she's had four successful... Oh, let me just turn this down quickly. She has had four successful breeding, or well, brought up four litters. That's the right word that I was looking for. Litters. She brought four successful litters up, and that's very, very well. That's amazing, really. You know, it's very difficult for a, for a leopardess to to have cubs in the bush as they are exposed to so much difficulty. And so Karuna's shown us a lot of her. Well, I haven't seen it. Ellen Fowler is, is obviously seeing Karula grow into her lifespan. She, Ellen was, a, was actually updating me a little bit earlier that she's 12 years old. So this afternoon I've learned so much from Karula from you guys, so I'm very grateful for that. And hopefully over the time, over the next few weeks, we're going to be able to spend some more time with Karula and get to know her a little bit better and hopefully see how she grows. I'm very grateful to everyone who, who's been offering to, to help me you know, over social media to grow and understand the Karula, but I'm very excited to, to learn and grow while I'm with her. Um, so if you feed information via Safari, Safari Live and to question, uh, questions at wildearth.tv, and so we can learn about Karula when we're with her. And I think that's the way I would like to learn about Karula, is when I'm in the presence of this beautiful young, well, not young, 12-year-old female leopardess. Well, wow. sorry. Zoe is asking, what do you think is the most important thing that you have learned in the last few weeks here as a guide? Well, it's, it's only been about five days, six days, so it hasn't quite reached a week. I think the most important thing that I've learned over the last week is, is relationship um, in, the, in context. You know, whether it's the relationship between myself and the cameraman, or it's the relationship between myself and the animal, or listening to the sound right. of the squirrel yeah. in the tree, which I, 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 I mis had yeah. mistaken earlier for a bird. You know, it's all about, for me, it's just trying to, it's, that's been the biggest thing, is trying to get a hold of the complexity. Well, complexity means the number of things that are influencing me at one time, and trying to handle them. So I think that's been the most difficult thing. Um, but at the same time, relationship is the word. Developing relationship to everything out here in the bush because there's just so much happening at one time. But it's been an incredible journey. You know, my stepmother's a presenter. She's a presenter for the BBC. She does shows called Spring Watch and Autumn Watch and Winter Watch. And so she's been able to give me a few insights into the way in which it is to be a presenter. And of course, she doesn't do live safaris. Live safaris is very different to that as scripted safaris or scripted anything. But she's able to give me you know, little things to, to be confident. You know, what does it mean to, to be in front of the camera and to talk to people and to actually be yourself in the presence of something that's very different? I think it, it's been very difficult to tackle all those different things. But, but yeah, thank you very much for that question. I know that took a, gave you a nice long-winded answer there. 
It's not like uh, how beautiful leopard leopardess is moving anyway, so we can talk all about all sorts of things. So if you have any other questions on on you know what my history is or or you know how's my time been here or anything, you know, I'm, I'm happy to answer pretty much any question. Um, of course, if it's to do with some knowledge of the bushveld, I believe and I know that all of you are very very knowledgeable on tumor and the property here within and you know the more that I can learn from your guys experience the better I can be a, as a guide for you all and I'm so excited to grow as a guide with you here in the Sabi Sands it's it's a very new thing for me and as I said when we were by the fire last night well or two nights ago on Sunday night with James and Jamie and Brent I felt very intimidated when I was first here with them because they really are such amazing guides. They're really incredible in all their fields. You know, from James, who has just an incredible background of knowledge to almost everything. I just can't believe how much James knows and is, is very understood with the bush. And he's also very good at managing people and he's, he's amazing to Brent. Brent, who's incredibly intelligent to, to the way in which um, the wilderness is, you know, to, to the way in which tracking is, to the art of tracking. It takes a very, very significant kind of personality to understand that sort of stuff. And Brent has, has a personality that I've never very, ever encountered. And Jamie is incredibly humble. She's, she's got such a beautiful person, persona about her. Um, I feel very relaxed when I'm around. Jamie, and it's, it's just so great to have, her, to have her presence around. I feel very comfortable. And, um, and she's, she's very knowledgeable on the bush, and she's had some incredible experiences around here. So I'm very grateful for her, for her humbleness and her way. So every single one of the presenters are providing such rich diversity in my life and giving me a lot of encouragement and helping me believe that I have the opportunity and the potential to be a good guide here on Safari Live, and I look forward to growing with the viewers and growing with the directors who, you know, it's incredible to, to, to understand the, the, the amount of work that goes into this process that's happening right now for me to be sitting here with, with you on live TV with the beautiful Karula, you know, from Kono who came and fixed my, my battery in the car to, to the ladies that are sitting behind the computer dealing with all the, the questions and feeding them through to me, you know. Every single person has such a significant role in Wild Earth and the team really are so, so friendly. But, he, but we can see here Karula is very, very relaxed and she's, she's quite enjoying her time here. I'm giving a nice little lick to her paw there. With that, we're just gonna sit with Karula. Let's see how Brent is doing and get an update from him. We'll see you just now. Cheers for now. So as you can see, oh, apparently the, oh, here we go, the other male is on his way to join us. So I think that's the injured one. So as I said, I mean, oh, he's skinny, but I've seen male lions in far worse state than that. I've seen the, the mapohos look far worse than that and come back very quickly. One good meal and he'll be good as new. Well, good sign. Up, defecate, stretch, and greet the other members of the coalition. They come back from injuries that we would often consider impossible to return from. So he might lie down there for a while. We will keep an eye out on him. But in the meantime, Karula has decided to have a drink. We can see 
through the drinking right in front of us again. Look at her beautiful eyes as she licks in front of us, licks the water. Wow, incredible sighting here, everyone. <sighs> Taking that magnificent beauty. Those eyes are just incredible. Look how they just blend in to her coat. A beautiful, beautiful coat. She gets up. We predicted that she was going to have a quick little sip of water and get up and go to a new location. What are you up to now, Krula? What is your plan? What are you going to do? Look how beautiful... Oh, I know I keep saying beautiful, but that's extravagant. You are extravagant. That's another, another word to display your beauty. Oh, she's getting back down. So she looks like she really, she really is still quite tired. She got up, she guys just logged back in, she just got up and she just had a drink in the watering hole and she got back and is now relaxing again, close to the other watering hole, or the other little puddle. But there's a lot of life that's going on around her. You can see the, it almost looks like it's raining, but it's not, it's a, it's a little flies, little, what looks like midges that are jumping around the puddles in front of her there. I'm not quite sure what they are, but it does look, look like drops of rain, doesn't it? So cool. Wow. Beautiful sighting of you, Karula. I've got a feeling she might just stick to this position for a while. You know, she got up, she just got up from a position where she was probably for about an hour, so the chances are that she's gonna relax here for a bit, but she's also got her head up. So she seems, she seems slightly, slightly inquisitive, so maybe she's listening out for something that's going on around her. Hopefully, hopefully that is what she's doing, because the night time, is often an indicator of when she might be getting active, much like the lions are. So let's get an update from Brent and see how he's doing with the lions. For now, we're going to relax with Karula by this beautiful watering hole, and we'll see you just now. Cheers for now. So that other male has stopped. He didn't walk all the way through, but there is a tiny little signs of movement. So. Fingers crossed these big boys decide to get going and hopefully mm, roaring before the end of the sunset safari. So Christina in Wisconsin says, traditionally, there's supposed to be one male lion. We have five. What stops the coalition members killing the cubs of the other coalition members? Now, Christina used the word brothers there. I'm not very comfortable with that word because quite often these coalitions are not related and they'll meet up outside. So they could be two related and they might be half brothers, they might be cousins. So it's, it's, very, it's very easy to fall into sort of giving them very easy, nice human boxes that they don't really fall into. Now, Christina, also, it is not true that most prides have one male. Most lion prides, especially in areas like this in the Serengeti, have multiple males. So there will be multiple male coalitions, uh, ranging from two to six, or even eight in some extreme circumstances. So five is a good number. And Christina, all of them will generally, or they will mate with that same female while she's in estrus. So they'll take turns in mating, but they will know that staying together as five, they've got a much better chance of defending a much larger territory or coalition area 
then if there were just one or two and another group of five would come in and kill them easily. So it makes sense to be in big coalitions, specifically in this area where we have one of the highest densities of lions in Africa, specifically further to east of the Kruger. So this area is famous for big male lion coalitions. <coughs> oh, I swallowed a fly. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh. oh, sorry about that, guys. Oh, that's a bit better. Yo, as I took a breath, eh, one of those terrible little creatures went. A lovely sky forming above. Ryan's going to come show you now and see that very soft light forming amongst in front of, uh, behind of those lines. Look at that amazing skyline. There's not a photograph or painting in the world that can give you that same impression as you can get it live. So I'm just might might have to be on the radio for a little bit. So while I'm on the radio, Karula is on the move. Here we are, everyone, next to Mike. How's the Mike? How's the kid? Hi. We're just with the leopard. The leopard's just got up. Karuna. Can you see her? Oh, there she is. Wow, everyone. It's fantastic to be back with Karula up and walking again. To be honest, I thought that she might just relax for a while, but it seems she's back and active, back in action. So we're gonna see if we can follow her. There she is. There she goes. Just gonna switch on my lights. Should I keep them on, John, right? Wow. Beautiful. So, we actually w watched her walk this way not so long ago. So she came from the other side of Shabam. She walked into that watering hole. So she was actually quite interested in getting something to drink at that pan, but she got chased away by the one-eyed buffalo. So let's, it's, it's actually quite interesting to see that she's not walking the other way. That's something that I want to note, because I thought that maybe her, she would have taken her cubs through to Little Gowrie, which is the other side of our traverse. So we wouldn't have been able to follow her. So she's actually going on the way. So this might be telling us a whole new story, everyone. Whoop. There we go. Karula's just going to the toilet, as we all need to in the day. What's really interesting about um, leopard dung is you can tell the difference between the different types of dung. Leopard, leopard often have a very long, strip to the end, which you can tell that it's a leopard dung. Hopefully we can have spent some time. We'll get to know the dung a little bit later. It's very important in terms of tracking. When you're tracking an animal, understanding the different...
terms of understanding your way around the bush, seeing what, what is caracal, what is, you know, what is leopard. Wow, could you smell that, John, right? <laughs> Karula, that was quite a smelly, smelly one. Debra, it's an interesting, it's interesting, I have absolutely no idea what she, she might be doing, you know. It, it looked like she was quite full earlier, and it looked, she looked around 70 to 80% full, so she could either be going off to her cubs, which are somewhere here, or to her kill where she's already killed. But we went and had a look here a little bit earlier and found that there were, it was the old carcass that was there. So it could actually be that she might be going out for a hunt. So it wasn't fresh, the last, last one. Here she goes. So we're going to do our very best to try and follow her through here. Please bear with me as I try to go through here. I'm going to try and focus as the VR rig in the front needs to be kept safe. Wow, isn't this exciting, hey guys? This is the first nighttime walk I've had with Karula. She goes. So I've got a feeling she's going to head in that direction. Oh no, it looks like she's changed her path. Hold on tight, everyone. Okay, I'm just going to reverse. Let's see if I can go in another direction. There she goes, there she goes. There she goes. Okay, as you guys can see, I'm going through a little bit of a thorny patch. Let's go and see what Brain's doing while I try to catch up with Karula. Just for now. So we're starting to see the odd oh, little stretch. The odd leg extend. I'm hoping they're going to get moving shortly, but oh, Brian, do you think they're going to do it before the end of that sunset safari? I hope so. I hope so. Oh, look at that. Little yawns. These are all really good little signs of um, possibly a bit of movement. Temperature is dropping rapidly, and darkness is by far a male lion's preferred place. Nice and cool. I think they have that added advantage of slightly better eyesight than everyone else out there, so easier to jump on and feast upon. at some pesky mosquitoes. Isn't this just one of more stunning sights about that beautiful sky with those male lines right there. I said, what and my head is going to pop in and pop it here. I'm just trying to see where the other male is. Well, 
Safari Dean is being the comedian this evening and saying, do I give the lions any hair tips or do they give me any hair tips? Well, Safari Dean, my surname is Leo Smith, so I am the lion Smith, so only fitting I have a mane. As I was saying, certain male lion coalitions aren't related or not all members are related. And Andy is wondering, would they invest energy defending each other? Most definitely, because without each other, they wouldn't be able to hold sort of court dominate over such a vast area and over multiple prides if they had to be by themselves or, or in a group of two. So yes, they would. And these coalition bonds are probably as close as brotherhood bonds once they've been established. Now, I know a lot of you will have heard this before, but lions, male lions in particular, sleep for around 20 hours a day. And even in that four hours of mobility, it's generally quite a stop start. Oh, I so heard something. Hello, big boy. Oh, big yawn. Buffalo in the distance, calling to him, saying, come get dinner. Well, it looks like that other male is up and mobile away from us at the moment. That's what he's looking at. Might be heading for a drink. There's some pan systems very close to here that still have water in them. Sorry about that. Brian is attacking the mosquitoes that are attacking him. And being quite close to those pan systems <laughs> means there's quite a few mosquitoes out and about this evening. This might just stick. I'm just going to find out if that other male is heading to the pan. Maybe we can catch him having a drink. Is that uh, third Birmingham heading towards that those small pan systems? Oh, scratch. Now, 
I always get this little shiver in of anticipation as it gets dark and the males start their stretching and yawning. And I always, always sort of cross my fingers, cross my toes and hope we might get a bit of vocalization because there's nothing quite like a group of male lions roaring to rattle your bones. Although he's not showing any sign of waking up just yet. <laughs> spending more and more time in this sort of northwestern area is definitely to keep those Salati males further away. And the Salati males sort of had the run of it for a while and so they started vocalizing quite close to sort of the Sydney's waterhole area and then it's prompted the Birmingham boys to move back up and see them off again. Oh, first sign of movement. Isn't this spectacular? Isn't this absolutely beautiful? Really good chance they might get moving now. So we're going to wait here, maybe reposition slightly. Uh, while we do that, let's go see what Samwise is up to. Guys, it was incredible. It was incredible sitting with Karula this, this evening and just going into the block there. Of course, Karula, we want to be very careful with her because we know that she has cubs in her den, so we've left the sighting. Um, we just went and followed her for just until she went into the block and we realized it wasn't actually worth it following her into that in case, you know, in case, in case of anything, really. We've had such a beautiful viewing of Karula this, this afternoon. And yeah, it was incredible. So we're leaving, we're leaving beautiful Karula. Hopefully we'll see her tomorrow or the days to come. Thank you to everyone that has been involved in that sighting. Fantastic. Otherwise, enjoy what you are watching with the lions. See you now. We've we'll just repositioned slightly so we can have a look at the Birmingham boy who's slightly more up and about. We did see a tremor of movement from the other flat cat, but by no means looking like he's going to get moving anytime shortly. Now the third male, I'm not sure he is, I think he's still lying off in the quarry thickets behind us. So this is a pretty good, you'll notice lions before they get moving, they'll do a bit of preening, a bit of grooming, 
before they set out. Second boy's heads up. Oh, look at that. Look at those teeth. Oh, big boy. I'm just going to move the, the light. I'm sniffing the air. Another big yawn coming. Oh. <laughs> he definitely looks like he's a bit grumpy. Still a bit sleepy from waking up. And Dylan and I was wondering why do lions and leopards groom themselves before they get moving? Oh, look at that yawn again. Well, it's because they are it's their big chance to sort of really, a good chance for them to really clean themselves. Uh, it's also an important time for a bit of social grooming between the, oh, another yawn. Oh, between the different members of the pride or the coalition. But they are quite filthy creatures, so it is probably better that they did take some chance to groom themselves and what better chance than before you head out for the evening and just say the same as a, a group of young boys heading out on the town to go chase some ladies or see off the resident, their resident rivals. A bit of hair gel, a bit of, a bit, a bit of sparkly jean pants. Not that us people from the bush know anything about that, but I have seen very similar behavior in big cities all around the world. Uh, I think when I was about 18, I remember, uh, the tropical bird is what I used to call it. The guys used to gel their front part of their fringe straight up. And for me, they just looked like a ridiculous taraka or go-away bird. And you see what they're doing there is removing probably a few small ticks and whatnot that have got stuck between his toes. And then you see that very small biting movement is generally for the removal of ticks or fleas. So you're getting right there in between the toes and obviously that's a wonderful spot if you're a tick. And get right in there. Eileen is wondering at what age are lion cubs safe from these male lion coalitions during their takeovers? Um, Eileen, a female, probably around three, uh, maybe a little bit older than three. A male, never. If you belong to the last set of males, you're never going to be safe. So, but if you're a female that they might be able to breed with, around three years old. Uh, but if you're a male, unfortunately, never. You will be persecuted by these guys uh, till you either move off completely or you are no longer breeding.
sorry, I'm just getting my settings right in case they decide to give us another one of those fantastic yawns. So, I know you guys have probably heard me say this a lot. Male lions are literally always going to have a fresh cut, a fresh wound, a fresh scar. And they are in constant battle, and I say, with each other. Oh, look at those teeth. As well as with other males, potentially. So it is literally tough at the top if you're a male lion. Another yawn. Oh, nearly. That wasn't a very big one, that was it? Unfortunately, it looks like these guys, which I sort of suspected, are going to take a little while before they get moving. Probably got a good another half an hour or so, maybe even longer, of grooming and stretching. They haven't even got up to defecate or urinate yet. It is still reasonably warm. It's not that cold yet. So they'll prefer to move when it's still a bit cooler. But hopefully they prove us wrong and decide to get moving in the next six minutes. Smelling the breeze. Oh, yawn. Next yawn or half yawn. Oh, look at those eyes. They look like they can stare straight through you. Now, quite often, a uh, male lion always give the impression that they're always looking oh, at you. It's also the shape of the, li the, the eyes. So there, it looks like he's looking straight at us, and he's actually looking quite past us, behind us. Oh, I do love their eyes. Piercing. Oh, we're going to stretch. Oh, he looks like he could definitely eat. Not quite as in bad condition as the other. Uh oh, Brian. Are we going to be sent Mark through a quarry bush? Mm. Hopefully not. No, he walked through. Oh, held my breath there for a second. I have been sent Mark by a male lion before. It's a very unpleasant experience. Now, a bit of stretching, maybe a bit more grooming. But these are good signs. And it's time to move. Hopefully, you might go drink. Oh, you can 
smell that from here. Now, if you eat lots of rotten meat, you can guarantee it's not going to smell too pleasant. He's not looking too, too well. And you can see those ribs sticking out. As I said, I've seen male lions in far worse condition than he is, and they've survived. Now, whatever ails him is not of human doing. So I know a lot of you will want us to interfere in this situation. We will not. We will let nature take its course. It is nature after all and who are we to say what is right and wrong and lions are being lions uh, doing exactly what they often do get up move a little bit and then flop straight down again uh, that's why it takes in their four hours of movement there's quite a lot of napping in between i don't think they're going to move too far just yet i think it's going to be another 45 minutes or an hour or so so we will definitely come check for these big boys in the morning uh, very exciting that we've had both lion and leopard on the sunset safari. And congratulations to Sam for finding his first leopard. Well done. And we're going to let these Birmingham boys rest. Hopefully this guy manages to get a meal and we'll start looking a little bit better in a couple of days. But it has been spectacular and I think tomorrow morning we'll be... James and Jenny entertaining you. Sam and I will be out on tracking team, so don't forget to join us for the Sunset Safari.